and Merry Christmas to everyone. It is December 25, <laughs> 2023. I am so glad, I am so elated to see each and every one of you this morning on this Christmas morn. Uh, I am Reverend Marymon Boyd. I'm your pastor for this morning, and um, there are a few announcements. Um, it's going to be a service on the 30th, and I think that's December 30th at 5 o'clock. That's Saturday, yes, indeed. And then December 31st at 9 a.m. And then there's the Epiphany Box, and I think they'll be collecting things until January 7th. The Environmental um, Committee is collecting and recycling holiday lights and batteries, and they'll be doing that until the 31st of January. And the recycle bin is somewhere close in the church. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and begun December 17th, and it'll last to January 28th, will be the recycling of of trees for the also the environmental community. I'm I'm looking forward to this soup and chili cook-off, <laughs> January 27th, and that'll be 2024 at five o'clock. I'm gonna be there. Say it again. That's right. I, I'm going to do the eating part. <laughs> and I think that's all the announcements. We've prepared some songs to sing and some prayers to pray. Also, um, there's an asterisk inviting everybody who's comfortably able to rise in body or spirit. Please be mindful of that. And uh, what else can we think about this morning? Apart from the gifts and things we opened this morning and last night, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And I like that when we do this, we uh, breathe in the Spirit of God that's all around us with a deep inhale. And then exhale the Spirit of God all around you, closing your eyes, focusing your heart, your body, your mind, and your soul and prepared for worship as we hear the ringing of the bell.
Thank you, Stephen. Everyone, as we are lighting the candles of Advent and the Christmas candle, Christ candle, let us prepare our hearts and minds to sing the first carol, which is, We Light the Advent Candles. Will you stand? We light the Advent candles against the winter night to welcome our Lord Jesus, who is the world's true light. Welcome our Lord Jesus, who is the world's true light. Join me in our call to worship. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill toward all. Jesus is our Emmanuel, God with us. Come together, our tears and our laughter, our work, and play into God's love. Let us pray. God, glorify Jesus in us. Anoint us to present the good news to each other inside these four walls first, then beyond the four walls, to become a church without walls. God, we surrender to you and embrace the simple idea that not only have you liberated us, but you have liberty with our souls. Amen. Our second carol, as you may be seated, is Joy to the World, number 171.
Our scripture reading today comes from John, the Gospel of John. And I will read to you from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, beginning at the sixth verse in the first chapter, and then picking up at the 19th verse down to verse 28. John 1, 6. It reads like this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light Verse 19, this is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed, but he did not deny it, but he confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you a prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say of yourself? And this is what he said. I am a voice, let me say that again. He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the paths, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize you with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Dear God, you are what we know as Wisdom that transcends beyond all of our understanding. And so, God, it is ours today to present the gospel. I pray that our hearts and our minds are open to what is being said. And we can only understand through Spirit's power. Grant us your spirit in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John are called the prologue. A prologue is a separate introductory section of literary work that comes before the main narrative. The Gospel of John helps us to imagine time before time existed like an incalculable measure of eternity. You see, we, when we read the prologue, the first words of it suggest that Jesus was the word that was in the beginning. Thus, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. 
The Word was with God. And how do we make meaning of that? How do we make meaning of such an ambiguous truth? Can we, we can accept a clear identification of the truth by thinking critically that some things are neither this nor that, but there are occasions where things are both and. Pause for a moment. This just happens to be one of my favorite, most favorite Gospels. And uh, this text in particular, and I'll tell you why. It's because it's filled with this rhetoric of <laughs> either this or either that. And most theologians use this idea of either this or either that. And some of us like to use both and, and I just happen to be um, an, an admirer of the latter. But I crave the former, so I guess I'm both and. <laughs> so making meaning out of the truth that we find confusing mediates between myth and history. You see, to me, this is the place where both and meets. So what does both and theology look like? Thank you for answer, asking that question. The Word was God. The Word was with God. In other words, God was Jesus, and Jesus was the Word made flesh. So, Jesus is both God and the Word. Jesus is the incarnate Word. So, Jesus also embodies all of the characteristics of the almighty, inf infinite God. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> The words in the beginning found in the Gospel of John relate to the wisdom myth of Genesis and summons the spirit of the oral traditions of an ancient Judaism. So the writers of John are a revolutionary group, and they form a community. They form a community of their own contextual makeup to reveal that the Word has been made flesh and is both light and the life of humanity. I love this because it's that group of people that produce John the baptizer as the one witness of truth, of the good news of, check this out, God's good news, only John. That's what it says. That's what they say. But this John the Baptist, the witness who was sent by God to testify of Jesus, who is, yes, indeed, light, life of humanity and the light of the world, respectfully. This John informs these vetting Jews, and he says to them, I am not the light. In verses 6 to 8, they identify him as one who claims that he is one who is sent to be a visible witness. And when the Jews and the priests and Levites, they, who are from Jerusalem, they ask him, they say, uh, who are you? He doesn't deny, um, but he confesses. He doesn't deny. He confesses that I am not him. Friends, he is a witness sent by God. And incidentally, in case you didn't catch it, he also is not a writer, so he didn't write the Gospel of John. John proclaimed 
that the coming of the Word, who would embody God's presence within the world. John was that one who said, there's one coming that's mightier than I, whose sandals I am unworthy to untie. So when you study this text, take special notice that God sent John into the world. Also notice that God sent the word into the world. I also want you to notice that this text, in this text, that the word and the light represent the life of the embodied presence of God in Jesus Christ. Can I ask you a question? Of course I can. Is John the only one who witnesses to that light? I'm closing with this. The verses 19 through 18, 19 through 28, reveal the importance of John as an example. I want you to hear that. The text says that, well, it teaches us that John is an example. He's an example who understands his own identity. He's an example who not only understands his own identity, but he understands the identity of Jesus concerning the history of the Jewish religious community, which Jesus belonged to. I don't know about you, but I got happy about that because, dear heart, that is the good news of this text. The good news is, in this Christmas season, that John is our example of how we identify who God is. I hope you caught that. I digress. I think the word is getting around that I'm one of those preachers that like participatory sermons and I kind of like pick on people in the crowd. So don't think that you will be exempt today. (laughs) If you will indulge me or check this out, how about just be obliged to help me preach? I'm going to ask you this one simple thing. Look at your neighbor. Come on, look at your neighbor. Don't look at me. Look at your neighbor. And look at your neighbor and tell them, I ain't God. (laughs) Hey, I was hoping you knew what I'm talking about. You know, I know that's not proper English, but I promise you that's right. (laughs) And because we live in an improper world that does not have enough time or patience to listen to your political correctness. But we know on the inside, because we are identified with Christ and we know who we are, so this is what runs through my mind every now and again. Who can take the sunrise and sprinkle it with dew, cover it with chocolate, and make a miracle or two? (laughs) It ain't the candy man. (laughs) God can. Amen. With me, friends, I I invite you to um, a moment of morning prayer and silence for all of the first responders. The reason I bring this up is because during these times, (sighs) these are difficult times, difficult days, and sometimes the person who needs help is so obnoxious that it gets on the first responder's nerve. (laughs) 
I want to pray for that nerve to give that first responder what that person needs to honestly and genuinely and authentically be in the moment for the person who is in need. That's what we as first responders do. So I wanted to add that to your prayer. So in silence, could you do that? God, your scripture teaches us that you are a wonderful counselor and a mighty God, a prince of peace. Scripture teaches us that you are there in a time of need, a rock and a shelter in a weary land. God, Ezekiel told us you are a wheel in the middle of a wheel, and we've learned that you are everywhere at the same time, and then your places where we cannot even be when we want to be there and we can only be there in spirit. I pray, God, for all of those in this room. I pray for their families. I pray, God, that whatever it is that they're in need of, God, please be there not only in spirit but through healing and through miraculous power because we know that this gift that you gave us who we call and claim as our Savior, Jesus, God, we thank you. We understand that many of our prayers are only help, 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 or thank you, thank you, thank you. And God, you never stop giving to us. Thank you. And we pray, God, for continued happiness for this bright future, the church. And we ask that as we pray, that you remember our prayers. And friends, as we pray together the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next carol is Love Came Down at Christmas. It's found in the middle of your bulletin on the handout. Insert. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you for singing. <clears throat> I invite you to be with me in our Holy Communion. Welcome to the joyful feast of the people of God. This table is for all those who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. All people are appreciated. God be with you. Great is the mystery of faith. Praise to you, Lord Jesus.
We give you thanks, almighty, eternal God, always and everywhere, through Jesus Christ, the one only begotten by you before all time, by whom you made the world and all things. We bless you for your continual love and care for every creature. We praise you for forming us in your image and for calling us to be your people. Although we rebelled, you did not abandon us, but sent prophets and teachers to lead us into the way of salvation. Above all, we give thanks for the gift of Jesus, our Savior, who came to us as a baby in the manger and grew in wisdom and in stature in obedience to you. We lift up the good news of his faithfulness, even though it meant death on a cross. And we glorify you for your power over death as you raised Jesus to reign with you forevermore. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us in truth, defends us in adversity, and gathers us from every people to unite us in one holy church. With the whole company of the angels and saints in heaven and on earth, we worship, we glorify you, God most holy. You know, it was on um, a very special night when Jesus was at a party entertaining friends. Jesus was among friends. And even though there was someone there designated to betray him, Jesus stayed the course. You know, I learned that we can burn so many bridges by trying to dish out what's been dished to us. Maybe this is a word for somebody at communion, because it was on that night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And I believe it was just this tough to break to. <laughs> <laughs> he blessed it he broke it and then he gave it to his disciples and he said this bread represents my body as often as you do this do it in remembrance of me and after supper in the same manner he took, he, took, he took the cup and, and he, he poured the cup. There it is. He, had, he didn't have as much trouble as I'm having. He poured the wine. He said, this wine represents a new covenant in my blood. And he said, take ye and drink all of it. And you do this in remembrance of me. And then he gave him a promise. He said that he would not eat of the bread and drink of the cup again until he saw them in their promised state. Friends, we serve a God who fulfills promises. God, we thank you right now for this bread and this wine. And God, we thank you because this represents what Christ had done and completed. 
we thank you for the fulfillment of that promise. And every day we remember you. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And as we partake of this as family together, we pray for that presence that you promise. It is in Christ's name that we pray. And all the people said, you may come. Friends, let us commune together the bread of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does everyone have a cup? Let us all commune together. Thank you. The gifts of God for the people of God Let us prepare for our Christmas offering. <clears throat> God, you are my helper and the upholder of life. With a free will offering, I sacrifice to you in gratitude 
and give thanks to your name, O God, for it is good. For we know it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. I want you to stand and let's doxology. Let us pray. With these gifts, we accept our praise and thanksgiving. Use these gifts and us as we witness to your presence in this world through Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing our last hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and sing it with feeling. <laughs> Hark. Friends, go forth rejoicing in the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, God bless. <laughs>